back. If that wasn't confusing enough for you, wait until I get into <laughs> the creation of this album and the band. Um, we are covering Moody Blues. Uh, the album is called Days of Future Past from 1967. It's currently 47 on besteveralbums.com. Moody Blues was an English band that started in Birmingham in 1964. And the original members of the band are Mike Pinder, Ray Thomas, Denny Lane, Graham Edge, and Clint Warwick. Mike Pinder and Ray Thomas were formerly in two other bands together before this one. At this time, they were playing R&B and they were the house band for the Carlton Ballroom. And that's when they first started using the Moody Blues as a band name as well. The band obtained management through a company called Ridge Pride and leased their recordings to Decca Records. They released a single called Steal Your Heart Away, which did not chart. They then released their second single in 1964 called Go Now. That single went number one in Britain and number 10 in the United States. Then they signed directly with Decca. Is that the Decca that we keep hearing about over and over again because it's come up a couple different times Mm -hmm. yeah that was a big label in in britain i'm assuming it's the same i believe the label's called london records in the united states their debut album was released in 1965 and was titled magnificent moody's after that they released some more singles that only did minorly well in the uk in 1966 warwick and lane left the group and they released some more singles and reformed in 19 November of 1966 with John Lodge and Justin Hayward. Two of the me- two of the original members left and then two other guys went in and Ray Thomas and Mike Pinder actually knew John Lodge from before and offered uh, wanted him to be in the band but he went to college instead. And then Hayward, I think they also knew him and both of them are have been in the Moody Blues for the basically the entirety of their existence at this point um, up to present day. At this time, they had some success with some of their songs in, in Belgium and France. So they were touring mainland Europe mostly because they weren't as successful in the UK, but they could still make a good living playing kind of the R&B stuff along with their original music in, in Europe. So around this time, they decided to stop covering R&B songs and switch to performing their own material. This revamped version of the Moody Blues released a single in May of 1967, and this also failed to chart in the UK, but gave a hint of the sound to come. I mean, as you can see, they weren't really successful out of the gate for a while. It's not like one of these bands that, you know, were flashing the pans or or just had immediate success. They really kind of were playing for a long time without too much of a following. This new sound that they switched to featured Mike Pinder's Mellotron, Um, The flute also became a more prominent instrument played by Ray Thomas. So now I'm going on a little little side side, uh, divergence here. What is a Mellotron? Well, it looks like a little piano and and you push keys that play different sounds that were recorded on tape. It's actually an analog sampler and it was created in Birmingham in 1963. So it generates its sound using analog samples recorded on audio tape rather than digital samples. So you push the different keys and the tape runs through the machine and depending on where it is in the in the spool, you make different sounds with the keys. So it's not like a piano in that way. It's really just like pushing keys to make different sample sounds. It's like the uh, the ultimate instrument in prog rock is what I always think of the, the Mellotron yes. as because they love it. So. Yeah, and there's some good videos on YouTube actually that I saw of the mellow tr- people playing the Mellotron explaining how it works and what Do it does. Mean- Go ahead, John. Uh, you're, you're going in one direction, so I'll let you finish. Matt. I was just going to say, it's the yeah. it's the beginning of Strawberry Fields. If you know that Strawberry Fields by the yep. Beatles, that's the that Mellotron yep. sat in the beginning. And there's another famous song we've covered in a previous episode that has the Mellotron all over it, played yes, uh, by Rick Wakeman from Yes. Do you know that one, Matt? Was that The Pretty Things? <laughs> nope. Wait, no. wait, the album we covered, we, didn't cover, we haven't covered a Yes album. It wasn't a Yes no, album. No, but Rick Wakeman from Yes played the Mellotron on a very famous song we've covered. Oh God. It'd be Space Oddity by David Bowie. That's the oh, that okay. creates the Space Odyssey. Yep. yep. So go ahead. Yep. And the Mellotron is used extensively on Days of Future Past that we're talking about today. As as Matt pointed out, it's also on Strawberry Fields Forever and as John said, it's on Space Oddity. It's also used by King Crimson, mm-hmm. um, who we'll be talking about 
in a few you know future episodes it's also been used on a rolling stones album that we aren't going to be talking about uh their ma- satanic majesty's request it's on uh matt's beloved genesis early genesis albums the mm-hmm. mellotron yeah it's on and oh, i can't wait for those and, episodes. and and more great albums that matt likes yeah. too yeah yep it's on i'm just wait- gonna get me a hey guys <laughs> early christmas present i would yep. love a mellotron yeah yep. It's on Oasis's Wonderwall, and oh, it's, wow. it's wow. on uh, Radiohead's OK Computer. Yes, it well. definitely is on OK Computer. I knew that without so, even having to listen to it. Yeah, I thought Matt would appreciate that. Those those bands are OK. Yeah, as well as a lot of other. Those are the more famous ones, but um, so this brings us, uh, you know, back to the Moody Blues, back on track. Uh, this brings us up to the current time period of the album Days of Future Past. Their contract with Decca Records was about to expire, and they owed thousands of pounds to the label. Their second planned album <laughs> had never probably come the out. ones that they had to recover from that deal they cut with the Rolling Stones. Where remember they had to give them like a huge royalty rate to sign them. If you remember from last That's week, right? Yeah, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so. Yep. So they made a deal with the label to make a rock version of Antonin Dvorak's New World Symphony mm-hmm. to promote the company's new Duramic stereo sound audio format. So I guess the Duramic part is more of like a, a brand label um, for the for the company. Um, side note, Antonin Dvorak was a Czech composer and New World Symphony came out in 1893. I did listen to a little of that. Um, that album was never completed. They never even made that album uh, with the New World Symphony. However, they convinced the composer of that project, Peter Knight, who was responsible for the orchestral arrangements, to collaborate with them using their original material. And this resulting hybrid concept album was Days of Future Past, and it was released November 10th of 1967. It peaked at number 27 on the UK charts, and five years later, it reached number three on Billboard charts. Wow. Yeah, so this is really an album that people, I guess, found over time and then slowly, very slowly gained ground, uh, at least in American. Was there any other... Because that seems like to go pretty high in a very long period of time. So that means it's cutting out, you know, newer stuff. Was there anything in particular? It wasn't like used in a movie or anything like that. Was there any other reason for the? Not that I can. Not that I read. Wow. Um, Yeah, that's impressive. Kind of similar to the David Bowie origin story when you think about it. Like there was there, it had some success, and then like three years later, it blew up. There were some re-releases of the album um, that I'll get to, but I think that helped as well. The concept of the album itself, as you can tell by the titles of the songs, is that it takes place over the course of a single day. It used the, quote, London... Oh, okay. (laughs) You, you didn't pick that up. Based on the song. Oh, he's not boy. a John, lyrics guy. John, I, I'm, a, I'm not a, I'm not a lyrics but guy the or a song the title songs. guy. All right, I know. Yeah. I, I was kidding, John. I was kidding. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank God. All right. So continue. I'm sorry. I was going to. Yeah. It used the quote London Festival Orchestra, which is a name they just made up for the collection of classical <laughs> musicians under the Decca label that played on this. And then they added London to sound fancier. So it really wasn't there was an actual orchestra. Yep. The drummer Graham Edge wrote the opening and closing poems, which were recited by Mike Pinder. And however, the orchestra and the group never actually performed together when producing the album. Mm-hmm. So the band would play a particular song or part, and then they would send it over to Peter Knight, who would compose an orchestral uh, linking portion that's quote which wow. the London Festival Orchestra would then perform Tony Clark produced the album and continued working with the Moody Blues for the next 11 years sometimes Tony Clark is known as the sixth Moody engineer <laughs> Derek Varnels is also heavily credited with creating the early studio sound the two singles from the album are Nights in White and Satin and Tuesday Afternoon Um, Knights only made it to number 19 in early 1968 on the UK singles chart, and Tuesday didn't chart at all. In later reissues in the 70s, it charted higher in the UK. In the US, Tuesday afternoon peaked at 24 on the Billboard chart upon release, and then Knights didn't even make it into the top 168. It only peaked at number two on a 1972 re-release. And finally, um, so that brings us up to this album. I'm not going to go into their history after the fact, um, even though this is the only Moody Blues album we're going to be covering. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018. This is basically cited as an early example or one of the earliest examples of prog rock or progressive rock. And it's known, this album is known for its fusion of classical and, and rock music. So, John, 
after hearing this album, are you are you now the seventh Moody? On this? <laughs> this this was a fascinating listen because I listened to this three times, and the first time I listened to it was basically a WTF reaction. Like I was not prepared for this because yes, um, I know some I know some Moody Blues, and I even know some Moody Blues on this album, and I still wasn't able to quite contextualize what this is so the first time i listened to it especially the first half of the album i was very lukewarm on it and then i listened to it a second time and especially the second half of the album really grew on me to the point where i would say that i liked it by the third time i listened to it i would say it had moved into the recommend category for me um and it really it's proto prog rock for sure um the longer compositions don't seem overly long to me. Um, that Mellotron is, I had to look up what it was because it's all over the album. Um, the flute yeah. is also all over the album. Um, it, because there's an orchestra in it, there's just a lot of sounds going on. Um, and trying to place each of the sounds requires multiple listens, but it's an enjoyable um, listen. And, yeah, it was. I I really liked it, and it really came out of left field for me because it was. It's it's very unlike anything we've covered so far. Um, but it ended up being in a very pleasant way for me, and the songs had a had a way of really getting stuck in my head <laughs> for long periods of time, especially Tuesday afternoon. Really, like I don't know what it was about that chorus that like you know the drawn out like. Tuesday afternoon and then the transition into the like harder well produced I I don't know how I think you just have to listen to it but the transitions I thought were really good on a lot of the songs and and I ended up liking this album quite a bit so um I, I'm interested to hear what you guys think about it because I can add more but I don't want to take up too much time I love this album this I is knew great it. I knew you this loved it. is great yeah um and I, I, I have similar reactions to you, John, um, in that the, it was definitely surprising, right? So I, I mm -hmm. thought the first track is pretty much all orchestra or, you know, it's, it's, yes. it's, it's like a classical piece of music. And I was like, okay. And real over-the-top orchestra, like yes. a Disney movie type orchestra. Yeah, like a yeah. soundtrack to a movie almost. Or yes. Or something. Yeah, and that's that's a great that, – I was going to say that because this it sounds like a lot of – this could be a part of a movie soundtrack, you know. Um, like, the, like the music itself is telling the story, you know, without right. any, any words or lyrical content. Um, so – I, you know, and, and I could also tell that it seemed like almost like an overture because I could tell, right. um, I could hear the only song I knew on this was Nights in White Satin, and you can hear parts of that. So they're actually in the beginning, they're kind of doing a quick little, you know, they're giving you snippets of, of what's to come later on in the record. So I was like, oh, okay. It's kind of like Tommy, right? When you listen to Overture on Tommy, it's like, you know, going through yeah. different parts. And then I was just surprised that they stayed with the orchestra throughout the whole <laughs> album, right? Um, <laughs> But when I saw them kind of all of a sudden, you know, I, uh, you know, kind of um, interplaying more pop music, more rock music with that, I kind of I, I got a better understanding of what they were going for. And I really liked it. I think it's fascinating, Josh, that you say that the um, that the band would do their part, you know, they do their part of the song. And then they and then the orchestra was layered on top of that. So it's done in two different rooms and you put them together and it's it, it's it's very seamless, like the transition from one part to the other. I love that prog nature of stuff. There's some really cool parts and, you know, that they that takes you in different directions and then it brings you somewhere else. And they're all really cool. They're really intricate. The melody. Are, are, are great um, and it's just it's a very interesting listen um, and I probably would agree John I think the second half is better is a, is a stronger half um, you know with the afternoon and evening in particular I loved peak hour though that that was like the the second part of the lunch break peak hour um, I, I really like that part but this is it's and it's interesting too because there were times I'd listen to this and I was I would lose track of what track number I was on, you know, because of, and I would, and it wasn't till later when I really started as I was listening and watching the, like seeing where the songs changed from the, uh, you know, on Spotify, I was just intrigued to say, oh, this is all one song. Cause it, it's just the entire album I, blends together I into see, one. And I, piece. and I did the same thing, Matt, but then I realized that when you look at what the compositions are, cause what it is is each of the seven compositions is supposed to be a part of the day from the morning until the night. And you can kind of, when you see what part of the day it is, the music 
starts yeah. to sound like that part of the day. That's true. Um, and that was kind of how, the th- by the third time I listened, I was able to do it based on, oh, okay, so now it's gone from the dawn into the morning, and now the morning into the lunch break. And there is a subtlety to it that you're like, mm-hmm. hmm, okay, I got it. Yeah. No, that's very true, And um, but I... Yeah, this is great. I was very surprised at how much I li- at, at how much I like this. That I've never heard this before. You know, I I have friends, you know, that are in into Prague and stuff, and how this. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know if anybody. This. I, I would assume that nobody's uh, come across this before in my circle because I'm sure I would have heard it. But um, I I really like this. This was great. Yeah, they. I am not as high on this album as you guys are but i i appreciate what it was trying to do i mean calling this a rock album is is generous at best it's really like like you said it's it's really classical music and i i mean cr- i'll do credit to peter knight because he's like doing the orchestra which is probably more than half of the album I- involved so he's yeah he's as much involved at this moody blues record as as they are and i read a little bit like when they you know when they would tour um you know, later on with this album, they would bring an orchestra to tour with them. Cause how could you play this otherwise really um, on tour? Uh, I, I like what they were trying to do. I didn't find myself uh, loving or revisiting it much. Um, I think I don't like that combination of classical and the rock folk that they put into it i'd rather have them separate i mean i think we've discussed this before a little bit about the combination that that some of these albums try and do um and whether or not they succeed for me um is debatable i feel like the i just don't know for me i don't know if it it really works for me having them together i don't i don't feel like it it gives me a lot. I'd rather just listen to them separately. Ultimately. Hmm. Um, I do like the complexity of the album though. I like, like you said, the different um, sound effects and the feel you get as you progress throughout the day. When you get to that lunch break, it's like, it feeling, it feels like people are going to and from work or something. There's like kind of a hustle and bustle to it. And I think the there's after- a lot of sound effects too. Yes, like I remember yeah. like train whistles and stuff in the background. Yeah, or yeah. almost like traffic or something maybe. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I think the afternoon is probably the most interesting song on the album for me, and and that's where I I got the Mellotron. Um, I picked that up as well when I was trying to listen for that. But can you imagine the marketing department on this album like trying to <laughs> trying to figure out how to sell this album to people because i can't even imagine yeah it's like a it's it's a combination of rock music and <laughs> classical yeah, I, and I, this for i love albums though that that like you look at it and you go this was released in 1967 and yeah. trying to it's like when we did the stooges album or when matt and i did that monks album <laughs> like it's certain albums in the 60s just come out of nowhere and mm-hmm. you can see that they're gonna be growers because they're just like incomprehensible as like when they were recorded they sound of another era to some degree right and and and, and that's what's funny about this. To some degree, it sounds like an older album than it is. And in some ways, it sounds like it should be right in, in the early to mid-70s prog rock heyday. Um, and, and I think, Josh, I disagree with you in my personal take in that I don't think I would want to listen to either of the parts of this separate. But mm-hmm. together, it enhances the two of them completely. I think the interplay is what really makes both pieces. And on their own, I don't know if I would have had as much interest. It'd yeah, be very I, different. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is, in general, not this like specifically. I think I'd rather have classical by itself and and mm-hmm. rock music by itself, not necessarily the parts of this album separately. But um, yeah, gotcha. I, I get what you're saying. Well, the thing that's interesting about this too is because you're right. It if you if you look back and and say, oh, this came out in you know the late '60s. That's kind of that's crazy. Nothing sounded like this. But man, I don't know if anything sounded like this since then. Like this is the 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 the, the combination because there's other music that you that you well, might listen to. You might be aware of that has the orchestra. But to this degree, the orchestra that's that dominant throughout the entire album, it's it's real. I think that's really unique. Am I? Am I? Can you think of anything else that's that's the that orca- orchestra? I mean, the Metallica but, album that they did with the the Trans- London Siberian but, Orchestra. But you're thinking, you're thinking orchestra though, and you have to kind of, I think, go with what prog rock became, which is this sort of bending of 
genres and experimentation because i i would argue that to some degree this is like a this birth i mean you're a big radiohead guy matt and as i was listening to this album i was like god radiohead must have listened to this album quite a bit because a lot of what radiohead goes for in okay computer even down to the mellotron a lot of the concept of that is similar to like what this is going for it may not sound the same but it's it's birth of the same idea, right? And, well, and the, like uh, yeah, to me, yeah. they're very similar in terms of the the the, the idea and the process. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I would agree with that. I, I'm talking more about the sonic nature of the or the the heavy orchestra that's throughout the entire. It's not just one song. Right. It's not just like the beginning. It's it's the entire album. And I would probably say that there's there's as much if not more of that than there is anything else musically yes on this it's 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 everywhere here um and i don't know if i know of another album that's like because yes you have like elton john did the concert in australia with the with the, the the london symphony orchestra like you have artists that do albums with orchestras but as a live performance but for an album a studio album this is this is unique in that way but you're right john there's like Did the progression is, of certain things it's definitely it's it's definitely there with that prog progginess and i love that and, stuff which is why i love this album as much as we talk about the Beatles influencing everybody, which they did, uh-huh. um, I feel like this would have had to have been on the radar for the Beatles in 1968 mm. and you know 1969 with some of the stuff they ended up doing. Maybe not putting an orchestra in, but I just see a lot of people delving into this album and and taking pieces. I mean, uh, the Beach Brian Wilson, right? You know, I'm sure could listen to this and certainly. You know the the early you know Bowie and Genesis and stuff. I mean, they all to some degree, I could see being influenced by this. Yeah, the Beatles. It's kind of interesting because if this comes out in late '67, this is right at the tail end of the Beatles because the next album that the Beatles did was the White Album. So, which was not really. I mean, there's some songs on that like "Happiness Is a Warm Gun" is kind of like a like well, three like different a day parts in the together. Life. A but day a day in the life, life was kind of. Yeah, but John, the day in life was before this. Sergeant Pepper was, was in '67. Yeah, like August gotcha. of '67. So, okay. Um, so that's what I'm saying. Like well, this, well, I, I don't been know the if same this time. Same they time. would have been. Yeah, they would have been interested in this, sure. But I don't know if I hear future Beatles rec albums taking cues from this. If that makes sense. Right. So. No, I, but it's like at around the same time, so they must have been processing the same stuff. Because yeah, oh, yeah, that's right sure. around the same right. time. That's what's interesting about it. Because as yeah. I as I listen to it, I'm like, this is like a day in the life Beatles. To some degree, yeah. So yeah, the it's actual, also interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. I was gonna say the actual moody blues parts on this album I've, are almost like folk. You know, it's a, it's a little like Fairport Convention or like British folk in some way too. It's not even like hard. I mean, there is some like hard, harder guitar parts, but there's not really. I mean, I guess it it works well, with the classical more, but like a whiter shade of pale by Procol Harum is kind of like this too. You know that song. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. I think so. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like I was thinking of what I was really fascinating about this album was I was thinking about all the different things that were spawned near it, around it and from it. And that was where um, just there was I wrote down like I jotted down like all these songs that it reminded me of. And I could mm. keep going. I don't want to keep doing that. But that's yeah, it's fascinating. You no, know, it's also interesting. It says that it was record. It was recorded. Uh, the last day was recorded, uh, November third, nineteen sixty-seven, and released on November tenth, nineteen sixty-seven. Oh, Is that possible know. to release like a week bad. after you finished recording and you release the album? Probably not. That's crazy, especially with something this complicated. But anyway, yeah. I mean, this is certainly an an outlier or a a very unique album that's different from everything we've listened to up to this point. And as far as I know about the Moody Blues, because I have a couple relatives who love the Moody Blues, it doesn't sound a ton like later Moody Blues either. It's not in my wildest dreams. Interesting. No, you know that song? No, you remember that song yes, from the yes, 80s? It, that's yeah, how well, I knew them for a while. Yeah, well, that's what, like we said, like we've often said, the 80s is when just about everybody from the 60s cashed out by, like, you know, doing a different version of themselves. Yeah, that was like right? an MTV yeah. staple for a while, I think. That was, I like so that song. So do they, they just continue to... Uh, incorporate classical music into their 
rock album? Is that kind of their thing? Not, not really. They, oh, okay. they have a very different sound all through the 70s and the 80s. Um, there's elements, but I, I, you don't think of the Moody Blues as like a prog rock band. At least I don't when I think of their stuff from the 70s. And I'm fairly – it's funny. I'm, I'm more familiar with their stuff from the 70s than I am of their 60s stuff, besides gotcha. Nights in White Satin. Gotcha, gotcha. I'd be remiss in not mentioning, too, that uh, the title Days of Future Past is is also – uh, later on, a, a famous X Men storyline in comics. So Chris Claremont must have been a, a big uh, Moody Blues fan to take that. So yeah, some t- if you're trying to research this album, you have to get through the X Men stuff first because that'll pop up before this. It even, yeah, it even says on Wikipedia. Did you mean Days of Future Past X Men? Go here. <laughs> uh, Google. Yeah, uh, um, sounds like you guys were you're high on this though. And, yeah, uh, it's definitely worth a listen because it's unlike anything we've listened to. It's not boring or uh, not even you know, off-putting or anything like that, in my opinion. If, if you like um, if you like your music not as much straight ahead, you're really going to like this. If you're someone who likes your music straight ahead, it might be a lot to chew on. But um, if you're willing to give it a try, I think it's definitely an album you need to listen to a couple times, even if that's not your M.O. I mean, it's certainly melodic, you know? It's, there's nothing oh, yeah. harsh in here. There's nothing nope. that's like kind of off-putting or kind of like too avant-garde, you know? So yeah, even yeah, if I it's some... 